Well, good morning, church. My name is Tyler, and I'm one of the pastors here at Life Mission Church. Uh, if you haven't been following along with us, it's been amazing to be going through the book of John and as a church body, as a church body, and Casey did a fabulous job a couple weeks ago with Proverbs 4, both upon which I will draw from today as we look at a portion of scripture that not only challenges me, but I, leave will, but, but I believe will challenge all of us. Now, as I've been meditating on this section of scripture, I vaguely remembered our church covering this passage before. And sure enough, we did, three years ago. However, I'm pretty sure I don't have it mastered. My wife and kids can testify. Controlling or not controlling the tongue has enormous impacts because the words that come out of our mouths are more than just the phonetic sounds they make. They destroy more. They build more. They encourage more. They tear down more, and they weigh more than I or we care to acknowledge. Not only does James speak about the tongue and our words, but all throughout Scripture. God's word gives insight into the right way of using our mouth, lips, and our tongue. So in addition to my right foot, uh, my tongue is not easily convinced of its redemption. However, after 10 years of marriage and nine years of parenthood, there is some evidence of sanctification and the need for more. And just like a blacksmith uses a hammer to shape its iron, so does the gospel continue to shape my tongue into a God-glorifying instrument. The process is a marathon. But I hope today we can praise God that as he sears the sinful flesh from our hearts so we can use the gift of speech to bless his holy name. So let me pray and ask the Holy Spirit to use my tongue for God's glory and the words from my lips would be pleasing to him. Holy Spirit, would you direct my gaze towards the Son as I seek you this morning, as I seek to glorify the Father with the words I say. Keep my heart in step with you. If there is anything that is not of you, may it not be said or heard. Father, would you reveal yourself to us this morning and magnify our affections towards the Son? I thank you that you have revealed yourself through the Word made flesh in Christ Jesus. And may your word make our hearts of stone become hearts of flesh this morning. I thank you, and we love you. Amen. So if you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles to James chapter 3, um, we're going to start there this morning, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, as Joby mentioned, we'll send you one, so let us know. Or the verses should be up on the screen behind me. Like I said, we'll be starting in verse 1 and going through verse 12. James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large, they are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among the members staining the whole body, setting the fire for the entire course of life, and setting on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. 
Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So just a quick background on James, the author. He is the half-brother of Jesus and later becomes one of the elders at the church in Jerusalem. Now James' reputation amongst the Jews and the growing church is one of respect and authority. As we see in Acts 15, 13, he settles a debate on how circumcision should be handled with the new converts or Gentiles. The book of James is actually one of the earliest of the New Testament letters. The book is referred to as some as the Proverbs of the New Testament. And all throughout James, he cuts straight to the heart. And here in chapter 3, he speaks with words of wisdom, warning us how we, why we woefully wander from the intended use of our tongues. Throughout the book, James makes clear that we should have audible fruit of a redeemed heart. He knew what Jesus said to the Pharisees, on the outside you are whitewashed tombs, but on the inside dead man's bones. And we'll see in this section today what our speech reveals. Now verse one, I feel this weight of this verse now. Even now because it says, for we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I know that I will have to stand before God on that day and give an account. I will be asked, did you feed my sheep? And so my prayer is that I teach the words given by the bread of life. Jesus even tells Satan when tempted, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. This is the food I hope we feast upon, that we may be eternally satisfied. Now, as James continues in verse 2, he gives first our reality, in which we all stumble in many ways, and then a reality that is not ours. He starts with a big if. If we do not stumble in what we say, we would be perfect, which is obviously not us, but our Savior. Jesus was and is a master with his words. I mean, he spoke them into existence. Every interaction he had was executed perfectly without sin. Whether it was rebuking Satan or the Pharisees, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, or offering forgiveness of sins, he used words to glorify his Father. In Luke 4, 22, it says, And all who spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth, and as Joby talked about last week, this was just after he had given, been given the scroll of Isaiah and proclaimed that chapter 61 had been fulfilled that very day. Now as James, James continues in verses 3 through 5, he gives fantastic examples of how something so proportionately smaller acts in mighty ways. And the first one being a bit in a horse's mouth. Now, I'm a big fan of the section in Job when God responds to Job's complaints. He questions Job's involvement in creation, and in this case, the horse. In Job 39, it says, Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at the fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword, and upon him rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness, he swallows the ground, and he cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, aha. He smells the battle from afar and the thunder of the captains and the shouting. And yet this animal that we read about, that Job and God are speaking about, is controlled by this. Actual bit I brought from home. This large animal controlled by a bit. In the movie Secretariat, Secretariat the horse, or Big Red as he, as he was referred to, develops a sore in his mouth. And this significantly hinders arguably the fastest horse to ever run. 
And in the same way, our tongues can inhibit our ability to run the course. In verse 4, we see the stark comparison between the size of a rudder and the ship. Wind propels the large vessel, but is steered by a shifting piece of wood, a fraction of the size at the captain's will. Now, I left my rudder at home, or else I'd hold that up too, so sorry. However, just like a rudder, the tongue boasts of great things. You see, the tongue is tied to the heart, the captain, if you will. And this is where boasting, where we start seeing grave danger in the misuse of our mouths. Because right after this, James begins to liken the tongue to a forest fire. And us Californians, we're all too familiar with fire. We know little smoke can lead to evacuations the next morning. The fires we have seen are destructive and do not spare all that they touch. There is lasting damage, and it takes years to recover from their destruction. And at this point, James starts laying down some hard truths. Not only is our tongue a fire, but a fire of unrighteousness that stains the whole body. Sinclair Ferguson says this in his thick Scottish accent, which I am not about to impersonate right now. The thing that will make the most impression on your fellow Christians and the people with whom you work on your home and your family is not the great big things that you do, not how you appear as it were on the public stage or arena, but the very simple question of whether or not you have mastered your tongue. Our words affect others, and they display what has affected our own hearts. In the Old Testament book of Proverbs, in chapter 12, verse 18, it says, There is one who is rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So not only do we steer our bodies with our tongue like a ship, but it can be wielded as a weapon whether for the sake of destruction and unrighteousness or for righteousness and building up. So just as a doctor carefully uses a scalpel to remove cancer or a soldier uses a sword to defend against enemy forces, both do so with precision. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So church, we need to use it carefully. Guide it according to the word. Now, there are times I know that I, and I'm sure we, get a little lazy with training and controlling our tongues. When we spit harsh words at our kids for their inconvenience. Or when we answer disdainfully sarcastic to our spouses. Or when we jump on the gossip train at work or amongst friends. Kids, teens, when you make fun of your brother or sister, or you snap back at your parents disrespectfully. All these things, we are speaking death. We are tearing down image bearers. So speaking of that, bedtime for me is a sanctifying process. Getting my three kids hydrated with water and answers seems to be my version of the refiner's fire. Requests to get water bottles that aren't within arm's reach, for an outdoor scavenger hunt. Or solving why our puppy eats horse poop. Each extraneous request exposes my heart. And as James says in verse 10, from the mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Now, I'm not actually cursing audibly or even thinking about certain things in my mind. But the attitude of my heart is definitely turning towards myself and turning from God. Then guess what happens after my kids are asleep? Oh God, you are so gracious to give me these children. Help me to love them like you love me. And God's like, I am helping you. Every night I give you a chance to show them patience just as I am patient towards you. Yeah. 
So Joby, he mentioned a couple weeks ago, our words reveal who we are. And so our tongue is an instrument in which we do so. And in today's world, not only is our tongue an instrument of revealing our heart, but our thumbs. Now I asked my brother to draw this picture and he nailed it. I'll probably hopefully get that printed on his shirt someday. But with the ability to respond to a written correspondence, AKA text, instantly, creates a challenge and a need for self-control. Too many times the connection between my self-defensive heart and my thumbs is faster than my brain can react. And there is more than ever a certain visibility into our hearts that was not possible before. The audience seems to have grown with the millions of people on social media. Your heart, exposed by your words, is now on display for all to see. Not only does this expose our sin to the world, but exposes us to the sin of the world. Proverbs 4 said to guard your hearts, not sacrifice it for the approval of others. There is only one in whom we should be seeking to glorify. And no, it's not yourself, because that can be a temptation with social media, but it's God. He knows your thoughts before they even turn to words. Psalms 139.4. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh God, you know it altogether. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And because of this, James even mentions in chapter 1, verse 19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes, be not rash with your mouth. Nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. So therefore, let your words be few. Now, I've been told that I can be quick-witted at times, and I love using that gift, if that's what you want to call it, um, to make people laugh, even if it is only me laughing. Because most of the time, it's just wasted on lame dad jokes. However, there are times and arguments where my quick wit goes unchecked and it causes dissension instead of joyful union. Proverbs 18, 6, a fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul. Most of the time we know when we should hold our tongue. But saying how we really feel is too tempting. We become foolish in our pride and we act immediately to protect ourselves or idols or maybe those are one and the same. Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control is like a city without walls. So what do walls do? They guard and they protect. Just as Casey preached two weeks ago, we need to guard our hearts. We need walls built by the word of God. We need walls like Nehemiah and the people built to defend the city from their enemies. Jesus made this clear in Matthew 12. We'll get there in a second, but our enemy, our enemy is sin. When there is sin in our hearts, our tongue is drawing water drawing words from a contaminated, contaminated reservoir. Now Jesus, in Matthew 12, he talked about this. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Uh, Jonathan Edwards had several resolutions 
that convicted him to action. 70 to be specific. And number 31 is one I thought extremely relevant for today. So his resolution number 31, he, see, he said he resolved never to say anything at all against anybody, but when it is perfectly agreeable to the highest degree of Christian honor and of love to mankind, agreeable to the lowest humility and a sense of my own faults and failings and agreeable to the golden rule. Often when I have said anything against anyone to bring it and try it to the test of this resolution. This goes right along with Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such that is good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. We need to master our tongues in such a way that the redemptive grace of Christ Jesus is made known through the careful use of our speech. We can't be jabbing into the air haphazardly. We need precision with responsibility. Psalm 141, great example. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds. In company with men who work iniquity, and let me not eat of their delicacies. So how do we do that? How do we protect the door of our mouth? What needs to change? How are we to speak life if we are dead in our sins? How are we to bless our Father in heaven if we have not been made alive by the Spirit? How are we to glorify the Son unless we are given a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone? Now if you want to turn to Romans, Romans 6, 10 through 13 tells us why and how we can do this. For the death he, Jesus, died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make it obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. It is only after we've been transferred from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light, then and only then can we begin to use our tongues as life-giving instruments. Joby has mentioned this before, and I'm going to say it again. There's no one in your life who needs another critic. preaching myself here. We need to be encouragers. We need to be listeners. We need to be reminderers of the gospel in which we are being saved. Proverbs 10.20 says, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. In other words, they're valuable. Your words when spoken in light of the gospel and for the sake of building each other up are more valuable than you may ever know. Now, I mentioned a couple minutes ago, bedtime is not my greatest moment with my kids. But there are times when I give them words of encouragement, and I can visibly see the change in their attitudes and their countenance. Encouragement is like fresh water for the weary soul. And when we are delighting ourselves in Christ, our reservoir is producing living water. Our lips are then speaking life into a world full of death and discouragement. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times that we need to say tough things to people we love. Because Proverbs also says, Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. However, those should be one-offs. Our default position should not be speck hunting. Colossians 3:15 through 16 And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful 
And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now I believe maturity of a Christian is not about how fast they can respond with biblical knowledge, but how quick they are to listen, how quick they are to show patience and gentleness. And I fail daily at this. Their ability to show love and unity even amongst disagreements. Psalms 15 says it this way, He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his friend. And chapter 13, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. Just as James says, your tongue sets on course the entire course of your life. So as we close this morning, I want to take a look at the end of Matthew 12, where Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees about the source of their words because he made a very sobering statement concerning our use or misuse of them. He says in chapter 12, verse 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. But praise God, church, that we who have placed our faith in the Savior are justified by his words. It is finished. Our words are a billboard of what we worship. They expose what or who our God really is. So let's use them to make his name great among the nations and our homes. And may our lips seek his glory and his glory alone. And I wanted to end with this verse from Psalm. Psalm 71, 15 through 19. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all that day. For their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come, and I will remind them of your righteousness and yours alone. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and still I proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation. Your power to all those to come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderfully perfect word. You give and continue to give words of life through your Son, the Word made flesh. Every word you spoke was to shine light into darkness and reveal the deep need for the redemption of our souls. Holy Spirit, would you continue to weed out all the roots of sin in our hearts that we may be like the Proverbs say, the lips of the righteous feed many. Help us to glorify you, Jesus, the bread of life who speaks to glorify the Father, the giver of all things. May we speak light into darkness by the power of your word. May our tongues seek to bless your name. Amen.